Rolling on sound. Rolling on both cameras. Let's go. Alright, can you please state your name? Mike Miller. And can, when I ask a question, could you like restate the question when you answer? Because I'm going to be cut out and it'll just be your voice. Okay, my name is Mike Miller. Perfect. How long have you? How long did you medicate? Uh, it's kind of a long story. I medicated most of my life. I was uh, an addict for a lot of years and I got strung out on opiates and to come off the opiates I got on cannabis to uh, relieve the withdrawals. And I probably did it for about a year you know then finally come off it and then I stopped using the medicine after I uh, come off it. Um, how does it help you? How did it help you get through it gave me an appetite because when you come off of opiates, you get sick, your body rejects everything, and the cannabis eased the aggravation and the withdrawals. What are some of the side effects of using medical cannabis? There is no side effects using medical cannabis. Why did you, well, I guess you answered. Does your doctor support your decision to use cannabis? I never talked to a doctor about it. Why not? I uh, never trusted doctors because they're the ones that got me started on the opiates. What does your family and friends think of you using medical cannabis? My a little story when I was 16 I got arrested for selling drugs and I had an ounce of pot in my pants pocket and I kicked it under the bed you know because the cops come in at four o'clock in the morning and I kicked it underneath the bed and grabbed another pair of pants. And I was in jail for like six months. I got out and went back home and my aunt, she raised me and she said, your uh, stuff's upstairs in your drawer. And I thought, well, my clothes are up there. So I went up and she had the ounce of pot laying right on top of my clothes. <laughs> and I went, I carried it there. I said, what is this? She said, I would rather see you do that than to drink. He said, I've seen too many people die of alcoholism. I'm a Native American. And I've seen a lot of my family get ate up by alcohol. And I've never seen nobody die on cannabis. Why do you want medical cannabis to I, right now, I don't do medical cannabis. I haven't in six years. Two years ago, a friend of mine was diagnosed with... Uh, breast cancer and I tried to get her to use it but she wouldn't because she was from the time where it was illegal and she wasn't going to do nothing illegal and she died about four months ago and like two weeks before she died she was ready to use it but it was too late and I really believe if she had have started on it with the Rick Simpson oil before you know, when she first was diagnosed, I believe she would have been healed. And I think everybody should have that option. Do you participate in any form of activism? Well, you know, I uh, used to be really involved when I was younger. And now I feel like getting involved again, you know, because her dying kind of relit that spark in me, you know. How did you medicate? How, how did I medicate? What ways did smoke, you? Uh, I smoked it. Or smoked, or it. Eat it. smoked it. Smoked it. Smoked, smoked, smoked. Lots. Have you ever been hassled by law enforcement? <laughs> <laughs> many times. Many, many times. Give us some stories. I. The first time I was locked up, I was 10 years old. I. Uh, it was over some craziness. It was nothing to do with drugs. I, uh, my brother was seven years older than me and he actually forced me to smoke pot first because he was afraid I was going to go home and tell on him. <laughs> and I enjoyed it. I had a lot of
trauma when I was a kid. I was abused, I was a lot of things. And it kind of got rid of all the, the pain and the aggravation. And it was a release for me. That's why I got, and when I was locked up, I uh, met a lot of people. I was raised outside of Baltimore, Maryland, out in the country, and there was not, nothing out there. No drugs, no nothing, no pot, no, you know, you got a little here and there, but when I got arrested and put in reform school, I was in there with drug dealers, real drug dealers. And I met all these people and all these connections, and I got out and went back, and everybody was looking. I said, well, I know where to get it. So I started making lots of money selling. I, I like to say it was just cannabis, but there was a lot of things I sold that wasn't anything to do with pot. And I always seen it as a victimless crime, you know, and I bust many times. I mean, you know, it was every month or two they was coming to the house. You know, back then the punishment wasn't that serious. You know, for pot, you know, they'd give you a little ticket and you wouldn't go to jail. It was just, but when I was, uh, I guess about 17, I got busted with like 16 counts of distributing narcotics, not pot. It was pills and heroin and stuff. And they put me away for a long time. I thought, well, this is it. I'm in there until I'm 21. And uh, while I was in there, the uh, the judge died to sentence me. And he, uh, the new one, reevaluated me and let me go. It was like, wow. You know, and it was like, that was the first time any authority figure ever looked like there was promise in me. So I left the area. And got into selling nothing but cannabis. Made lots of money and always thought I was staying one step ahead. But all the money I made went into narcotics that was going into me. And that's where it went for 30 years. You know, it was thousands of dollars in my body. And without the cannabis, I would have probably still been using it. Because that's what finally broke that cycle. Can you tell us what drugs you did? <laughs> it's easier to tell you what I didn't do. <laughs> you know, I started out smoking pot and then went to LSD and PCP and MDA and heroin and Dilaudid and morphine. And just, if I could get it, I would do it. You know, I uh, never was suicidal. But I've had a lot of people, you know, now that I've had time to think about it, you know, people would drop over beside of me overdosing on cocaine and I'd just keep shooting it. You know, like it didn't even, I, you know, over, I've had a stroke on cocaine. But I uh, actually come to an ambulance and they took me to the hospital and all I could think about was I had drugs in the room and my, Roommate was going to get off work and go back and do them. So I signed myself out of the hospital. And I went back to the hotel and I, it was crack, grabbed a pipe and threw a piece in it and started to light it. And all of a sudden I hear some, a voice, you know, and it, it was no one in the room. And it was like somebody said, are you trying to kill yourself? It was like, what was that? And you know, that was a spiritual awakening for me because I was raised that the unforgivable sin was if you committed suicide, you was damned to hell, which I know better now. But I mean, that was really the big, big turning point when I started looking for spiritual things in my life. And now I am a preacher. We have a ministry called the Bread of Life. We feed the homeless. We talk to them. We don't preach to them. We speak to them. You know, we know that God loves everybody right where they are. And the plant. God put the plants here. You know, Genesis talks about it. He said, I give you every herb. 
every herb bearing seed for you, not for the pharmaceutical companies. And that's the only reason it's not legal now because they want to keep it down and keep you on that stuff. You don't make know your butt from a hole in the ground when you're taking it because literally you're just in a fog. There's nothing good about the stuff they give you. You know, Sharon, her last days, she was just a shell because of all the stuff they're giving her. You know, and it really, it really got me mad. You know, because if she would have, if it would have been legal, she would have done it. Gatewood was a friend of mine. He, uh, actually was going to take it to the court. But then he died. <laughs> and it was like, ah, you know. It was a, it's been a rough couple of years, you know. But I'm through it. And now I'm back to doing what I should have been doing all along. You know, trying to get that fire lit again. So how, how do you go from being a drug addict to being a preacher? How did that come about? <laughs> that was, uh, okay, back, back up a little. About, I guess it's been 12 years ago, 13 years ago. I was living in London, Kentucky. I was smoking crack and doing crank and running wild. And I had a son that was three years old. And me and his mom had split up. We was, you know, and the, she brought him to me and said, he's your responsibility now. I'm done with it. I don't want, he's just like you. He's going to end up just like you. He's a mess. He's your responsibility. And I was like, you know, I couldn't even take care of myself. I was staying in different houses. These weren't nice houses. These were dope houses. Every night I was somewhere else. And I uh, took him to school the next day, going to drop him off. And I was abandoned when I was a child. And that's all I was thinking about was just leaving him, not going back after him. You know, going to leave him because I figured he was better off. And I uh, let him out the car and he started to walk away. He stopped and turned around and said, Daddy, I love you. And it was like, ah, so just stick a knife in me, you know, I couldn't leave him. And I uh, had been working at this church doing a, a tile job, and the preacher had been not preaching to me. He was just being nice. And every day he'd say, I need his lunch with me. And before he'd leave, he'd say, you know, Jesus loves you. Then he'd turn around and walk away. And I'd be like, why does he keep doing that? But what he was doing, he was feeding my spirit. Because that morning I went to the church, and there was nobody there, and I just gave my heart to God and started a, a road back. You know, and that's when I started medicating on cannabis to get off of the the pills. And I uh, finally, I went into a recovery house after I done got off everything. It was a church thing. I thought I needed to get all this religion and <laughs> now I find out that I had to unlearn a lot of this stuff I learned because it's just a lot of crap. You know, I uh, have never been closer to God than I am right now. And I know I'm doing exactly what He wants. So how do other preachers feel about you supporting Kansas? One on one, they're okay with it. But when they're not around me, I don't know. You know, I, I don't think they would come out like I am. I don't think they would tell their congregation they were for it, you know, because they're so scared that somebody may accuse them. You know, I know a lot of them look at me and say, well, he's probably smoking it, but I don't smoke it. You know, I'm not saying nothing's wrong with it. It's just not for me right now. I don't need medication. And as for the total legalization, you know, maybe somewhere down the road, but I think right now it needs to be medical purposes because there's a lot of children that need this. And if it gets to be legalized, then they'll regulate it and you got to be 21 or 18 or something or other. And these kids that need it aren't going to get it. And that's what it's about. It's about saving people. It's not about making people happy. What is your opinion on the church's current stance about cannabis? I don't agree with it. 
because they, you know, I've heard them say the devil weed. And, you know, God said, you can eat of the tree of life, you know, not the tree of good and evil. And the tree of life is cannabis. You know, there's so many uses for it. And to say it's a devil weed is just ludicrous. It's, it's uneducated people. It's closed-mindedness. You know, they don't want to open themselves up. That's all I can say about it. I, it's hard for me to go to a lot of churches anymore because their message is so far from what the real message is. You know, uh, Jesus said, God is love. You know, he said, come to me and your burden will be light. And a lot of churches, you meet Jesus and then they tell you, okay, now you got to do this, 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 this. Well, no, you don't. It doesn't say that. He said, I came to release you from the law, not put you in bondage. And so many churches put us in bondage. When I first got saved, I was in so much bondage, it was unreal. And until I got saved, I wasn't in that much bondage. I was out there running. I didn't care. And then afterwards, they threw all these rules at me. Well, I was happy until I come here. <laughs> and that's not what it's about. It, I get really frustrated with it. It is a organized religion in its worst form. And Jesus said, religion is a thief of all power. He said, true undefiled religion is feeding the orphans, the widows, Visiting the people in prison. That's what it's about. It's not about building a bigger building or driving a better car or, you know, I, I think he wants to give us things, but it's not about that. It's what, what can we do? You know, what can we do for a brother? Whether he's a Muslim, whether he's a homosexual, whether he's a, a murderer. What can we do for a brother? You know, love your neighbor. That's what Jesus said. So how the ministries begin then? What led you to that road and pushed you to become well, a minister? Well, okay, I was, uh, I lived on the street a lot. You know, I was so deep in the mess. I never was actually homeless, so say. I always had somewhere to go. But I was one step away from it. You know, I was, some of these people are so deep in addiction, alcoholism, and just mental illness that they have nowhere else to go. And I always had a heart for feeding people. You know, I love to cook, and it just seemed natural progression. I worked at a, a place for about three years as a, it was a rehab program that I went through. And I cooked and preached and teached and all kind of stuff. And when I left there, the day after we left there, me and Sharon started the Bread of Life. We made a bunch of sandwiches and took a bottle of water down to the park and gave it to the homeless. And that was three years ago and been doing it ever since. When she died, I actually considered stopping. You know, I because I've always run away from things. Thought about it and just... I don't need to. I need to face up things and step up to where it needs to be. So how did you meet Sarah? Working at the ministry we was at. She was a volunteer there. She, uh, <laughs> when she first came, see my outlook on religion is so different from a lot of people. And she was real religious. And she would, I'd say something to her, she'd storm out of there, just mad that I how dare you say something like that? My Bible doesn't. And she'd go look it up and come back the next day. Well, you're right. You know, uh, <laughs> you know she was open-minded. You know, and uh, when she died, she had a whole different outlook on it. You know, her outlook had turned to 180. She was uh, a teacher. She was teaching a lot of these religious folks. They wasn't wanting to talk to me. <laughs> You know, we'd go in churches to speak, and I would speak, and they would, like, never ask us back. <laughs> and she would speak, and they always just listened to her, because she came out of that same background. 
And they'd look at me like, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But, you know, it is a process. And I believe we will reach the people we're supposed to. And my people are the ones that I feed twice a week. I mean, they really are. I mean, when I first started going down there, they would look at me like, how dare you say something like that? Because the message is so different from what the church speaks. You know, they got them in so much bondage, but we're freeing them of it. They're actually smiling now. I mean, you walk in there and they're just smiling and happy. And A, a preacher come down there about a month ago. He's one of the old fire and brimstone preachers. And I preached, and then afterwards they had one of the guys cornered out in the parking lot, and the guy told him, he said, you need to go in there and talk to Mike about this. He done told me different. And I thought it was funny because that guy hasn't returned any of my calls since then. <laughs> but it don't matter. You know, it, it, I'm telling them the truth. I'm not preaching to them. I'm telling them that God loves them as much as he loves me. That's true. He doesn't wait for you to straighten out your life before you get there. You just come as you are. And as, as it goes, you will start letting go of stuff. You know, it wasn't instantly for me. You know, I've been saved for 12 years. And it's been a process, you know. And I would see these evangelists come in where I got saved and I got released from drug abuse and alcoholism and chasing women and this and that and you know, it was like God showed me that that wasn't their thing. You know, are they still a gossip? Are they still angry all the time? Are they still... You know, everybody's got things they struggle with. And that just wasn't their thing. They was a user, but they wasn't addicted. Everybody's got problems. We always will. But the thing is now, I know no matter what goes on in my life, I'm accepted by Him. And that's what I'm trying to convey. Every one of us are accepted. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about how you feel more, even though you did talk about Gaywood. How do you feel about Gaywood and politics in general? Gaywood was my friend. He was... Whew. He was... Uh, one of a kind. Uh, think about him and... He uh, would call me, you know, every couple of days, about 6 o'clock in the morning. And we would talk and we'd tell him what was going on with his life and we'd pray together. And until Gatewood, I hadn't voted in 30 years. The last person I voted for was Jimmy Carter. <laughs> and he kind of restored my faith. Because all of them I'd ever met were liars, they were cheats, they were so wishy-washy. And him, he was a man of his word. What he said, you could believe it. You know, he wouldn't whitewash nothing, he would tell you the truth. And you don't see that much, especially from politicians. You know, whatever group they're speaking to, that's what their side is that day. In the debates, he's the only one to come out and said that he was against abortion. Everybody else was, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he was like, I'm against it. I'm a Catholic. I'm against it. I have actually had preachers tell me, stay away from him. Because he's just leading you down the wrong road. I'm like, you know what? I believe God's put me in his life. And I do think that. Because when I met him, he had nothing to do with an organized church. I mean, he really was bitter. And I don't blame him because they all looked down on him. They looked at him as the guy that was that pot guy. You know, he stood for a lot more than that. I mean, I miss him. I, not a day goes by. It was uh, a friend of mine, Dave, died. And a month later, Gatewood died. And two months later, Sharon died. It's like, bam, bam, bam. Like, What's happening? You know, I mean, it really, and these were close people. I, uh. It's been a journey this past year, but it's getting better, you know. I, uh, yeah. What's your fondest memory of Gatewood? The memory that makes you smile? The first campaign meeting he had out at Perkins. <laughs> Me and Sharon went in there. And, uh, 
I had talked to him on the phone. He, uh, he was our attorney with the ministry. When we first started doing it, the city tried to stop us. They threatened to throw us in jail, and he was a Facebook friend of mine. So I sent him a message, and he sent me his phone number, so I called him up. He said, you go in there and you tell them that you're going to keep doing it, and I'm your attorney. So we did, and they left us alone. Anyway, we went to that meeting, and uh, he was going on and on, and his treasurer was crazy up then, and he came up and he gave us one of his books and he signed it and he was just so nice. I mean, you know, I couldn't believe it, I'm thinking. I didn't know what to expect. I knew he was different because I talked to him on the phone. But he was a great man. I mean, I really am enriched because he was in my life. In your opinion, what do you think the future of Kentucky and cannabis is now that Gay was no longer with us? Jake Jones. Jake is a young fella. His father got shot by the police. I really feel he is going to be in politics. I talked to him a while ago about it. I mean, I really feel he's going to get there. He's the future. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Mike? Just, uh, I wish they would hurry up and get on the ball and get it over with. Because back in the 70s, it was this close to being there. And then Mr. Reagan got in there with the just say no and <laughs> the war on drugs that has been a miserable failure. Get it over with. Let it go. Give up. You know, I mean, there's, there's no call for it. Why it's over. Th why do you think they've been keeping it illegal for Money. Years? Big money. The pharmaceutical companies. The oil companies. The DuPonts. The... Yeah, lots of money. They're keeping it down. Because there's so many uses for the cannabis plant that it would put them out of business. You know, and they can't patent it because it's a plant. You can't patent something natural. They can't figure out how to make money. If they could figure it out, they would have done did it. So, it's up to us. My final question is going to be as a preacher. Do you have any verse from the Bible that you would use when it comes to cannabis? Ah, uh, well, the one in Genesis, 1 9, I believe, where God gives you every herb bearing seed for your use. And I believe the oils they used were cannabis oils. And I can't prove it, but I believe it. Because there was a healing factor with them. You know, and granted, the oil is a conduit. But I believe there's a lot more to it than that. But the church would never admit it if there was. Matter of fact, a lot of them don't even know. I think that's a wrap. That was powerful. Did a really good job. That was job. very, very <laughs> powerful. Thank you. That was uh